Okay, so uh, this talk is going to be given both uh, by Didi Amar and myself. And uh, okay. so uh, some motivation. Uh, we've been working a lot on gene expression, and by now there is a huge number, almost two million expression profiles in GEO and how can we make use of this richness. Similarly, if you look at cosmic database, there are over a million cancer mutation profiles. And again, this begs the question of how to use it. And one way to put this in disease context is to use the disease ontology, which is like a go-like uh, ontology which that contains uh, over 6,000 uh, disease terms at this point. So we'll talk about two projects. One focuses on expression and the other on mutations. Uh, we go come from the angle of classification, but actually uh, the emphasis will be not on the classification itself, but on the biomarker genes, which we view as indicative of the disease. And this was done jointly with Tom Hyde, a student in my group, and uh, Shai Israeli, an oncologist in the Shiva Hospital. So the first project deals with expression, and uh, the motivation comes from the observation that single study disease by uh, uh, profile, uh, st single study disease biomarkers are pretty good in terms of predicting but pretty bad in terms of reproducibility, reproducibility. Namely, if you take two such studies, typically the overlap in the biomarker set will be near zero, or definitely not significant. And also, uh, these genes are pretty far from being unique, and as a result, their biomedical con context is, is quite low. And what we wish to do is to find biomarkers that will uh, use multiple data uh, profiles across many diseases in order to increase the robustness and the interpretability. And there have been some studies along these lines in the past, and we'll refer to some of them as we go along. So here is the overview of the, our analysis process. We start by manually annotating a set of over 13,000 profiles from GEO. And these are very diverse, uh, 170 data set coming from 17 microarray platforms. Uh, and we manually assign them uh, disease ontology terms. And then we perform classification, uh, identify those diseases that are well classified, and for those identify the differential genes or the genes that are uh, good as biomarkers, again using the disease ontology. And once we have at hand the biomarker uh, gene set, we integrate this with other uh, information sources like mutation uh, databases, uh, uh, drug targets and interactions in order to view, to create disease summaries that are uh, highly informative. So. Uh, in our data set, uh, we uh, covered 48 participating uh, disease ontology terms. Uh, as you see, cancer is a big part of this set, over uh, 5,500 samples, uh, but also some other uh, diseases. Uh, and the problem that we have at hand is multi-level classification in which uh, the same sample could have multiple uh, labels that are all correct. And there have been several approaches to such problem. First, we can learn separately each uh, single class for each disease. Uh, second, we could apply a Bayesian correction to this uh, single class approach. And finally, we could form a power set of the labels and then apply a multi-class model. And the data uh, is analyzed in a leave data set out crowd validation, namely in each, uh, in each of our tests, we put aside a complete collection of data sets in order to avoid any kind of uh, uh, 
problem with uh, with batch effects uh, and to make the validation as independent as possible. One can view the data, uh, uh, the, the results of the classifier as a probability matrix where for each sample and for each disease we have a probability that the uh, patient had the disease while uh, the true labels are a binary matrix of, uh, of the disease terms. And the way to evaluate it, uh, people have been using either global AUC, namely take all the values in this P matrix, sort them in decreasing order, and compare to the Y matrix in order to get the uh, AUC curve. Alternatively and more conservatively, one can look at one column at a time and compute the disease-based uh, AUC score. And we've been using both. Now a key problem in anal analyzing the data like this is uh, we want to use many diseases together, but as a result for every particular disease, we have uh, a small sum uh, number of samples, say 500 out of our 1,300 that uh, or 13,000 that have uh, uh, that were uh, measured for this particular disease and in this particular t tissue. And typically here the, we will have both cases and controls, and the controls are typically matching. They come from the same tissue, and they are very carefully chosen. On the other hand, all those other uh, samples come from different tissues and different studies, and they are totally uh, unrelated, but their size is overwhelming. So uh, we have to separate between what we call the positive, the cases for a particular disease, the negatives, which are the controls what are taken directly from the same studies, and what we call the background controls, all the rest. Because if we put together the yellow and the green as the, the negatives, the result will be that we will be essentially classifying the tissue and not classifying the disease. And the size of the case, the controls will be uh, tiny compared to all the other diseases. So just to uh, drive this point home, if you do a simple experiment where you have a 500 positive, 500 negatives, which are identical, identically distributed, and you have 10,000 background controls, you will get amazingly good uh, curves which are totally meaningful. So the point is that we really have to distinguish in such context where we look at many diseases together at uh, uh, th these three classes. And the solution is uh, to really w come up with a positive versus negative uh, score and the positive versus background. So we want the positive to be different both from the negatives and from the background controls. And on top of it, we also have a Q value that is computed by a study-based uh, meta-analysis. So we use all these three scores as a way to come up with a stricter evaluation. And if we, uh, when we apply the set of uh, classifiers on this data, so here are a set of uh, six classifiers that we applied. First of all, as expected, comparing against the background is much easier than comparing against the negatives. So the scores here are uniformly higher than here. And uh, surprisingly, perhaps, the, the uh, classifiers that are multi-label did not do better than simpler classifiers. And in fact, if we uh, just look at the number of well-classified diseases, which is that, uh, identified by both ROC scores above 0.7 and Q value below 0.05, then the simple SVM classifier was best. So we went along with it for the rest of the analysis. So here are the 24 well-classified diseases, by far, the majority is from cancer, but there are also some uh, well-classified cases in neurodegenerative diseases and cardiovascular. Now, uh, we also did an independent validation by looking at RNA-seq samples, taking the classifiers that we got on the microRNAs and testing them on the RNA-seq data, 
and the AUC scores were uh, extremely high. Uh, but note that with the exception of breast cancer, there are no uh, negatives in these samples. So these are just uh, positive uh, versus the rest of the, of the cancers. Now, if we plot the precision recalls uh, uh, plot, uh, we are doing substantially uh, better than a PNAS paper that just provided a particular point for comparison. So uh, the global AUPR is also uh, greatly improved. Now, what about robustness? As you recall, we said that robustness is a big issue. Uh, and uh, since we have collected so much data, we could take a very large class. Uh, the dog the dough uh, term that was largest was cancer, and we had 46 uh, uh, studies on it, and uh, learn separately, uh, so partition the data into small subsets, and come up with the biomarkers on both sets, and look at the overlap. And if, if the, you take five data sets at a time, this is the Jacquard score that you get for the overlap, and it is increasing when you go up till half the data, 23 data sets. And of course, the p-values are all very significant, but still a Jacquard of 0.2 uh, uh, is not uh, amazingly satisfying. Now, assume that this is a linear curve, so if we use for all our 46 data set, we will get near 2.3, and one would need the 100 data sets to reach a jacquard of 0.6. So the, the bottom line here is that, is that for getting robust biomarkers, we need even more uh, data sets that, than we have at the moment. Uh, we also, how did we select biomarker genes? So we wanted them to be separate, the positive to be different, both from the negative and the controls. And we say that the gene is differential if both is scores are above 0.65 and the Q value is significant. And in addition, we also wanted to avoid the situation so for here is an example. For this hematological cancer, we had 1,400 samples, and but 1,100 of them came out of leukemia. So we wanted the Q value to be significant when we limit our set to the 300 samples that are only hematological and were not inherited from the child. This is just a, to, to make sure that we are not inheriting anything from the those, uh, structure. So uh, here is one example of uh, projecting the biomarker on the protein interaction network. Uh, this was for the doterm cancer. And what is, we see here, uh, a lot of, uh, so actually there are two connected components. One is centered around P53, as expected. And the other one is perhaps more interesting. It is by and far uh, upregulated uh, in uh, mitosis as well as uh, cell replication uh, and cell cycle. However, this network is connected by these two green nodes that are both annotated as uh, cytoskeleton, which uh, brings up uh, the hypothesis that impaired rewiring of the replication pathway has a role in cancer. Indeed, there is some experimental uh, evidence for this. So I'll skip the disease summary for the time and summarize this part. We created a new gene expression compendium. Uh, we used multi-label classification with data set level cross-validation. We got good validation results on RNA-seq data. A uh, simple approach wins. SVM wins over the multi-label algorithms. And there is an improvement. Uh, the interpretation is uh, better using this uh, data set, uh, this uh, compendium, uh, be, uh, by identifying uh, disease-specific differential genes. And I haven't shown you the, inter the summary uh, snapshot that we have. Computationally, there are two take-home lessons. First of all, uh, this issue of separating the controls and the background is critical when one analyzes multi-disease data. And reproducibility is still an issue.
and <coughs> we need even more data than this. And I'll pass the rest to Didi. Okay, thank you, Ron. <coughs> so, in the second part of the talk, we will extend the flow, or at least use some of the ideas, uh, to other genomic data. Uh, naturally, for this workshop, we will analyze somatic mutations in cancer. Uh, which is great, we have that TCGA, a huge compendium of samples. What is not so great is that we don't have negatives for it, specific subtypes. And we already know that having a control set of negatives for a subtype is crucial to learn disease-specific uh, signal. So we can use the COSMIC database, which is a very large compendium of annotated somatic mutations. Uh, it's, it is easy to work with. There are more than a million samples in this database. But we always need to keep in mind that the vast majority are either from small-scale experiments or were not annotated or curated yet by the database. On the other hand, mapping the samples to their disease ontology terms, it's, it's much easier than the gene ex expression omnibus, mainly because COSMIC maintains its own control vocabulary, whereas where you work with GEO, you need to analyze free text, which is a very tough uh, problem. Uh, and you can easily map most of these samples to their disease ontology terms. Now, <clears throat> which part of this database can we actually work with for our goals? So, naturally, you can only use samples that have disease ontology terms, right? We cannot run the flow on other samples. Uh, we will work with binary associations for, when I'm talking about gene patient pairs. So, we took only gene patient pairs in the database that are flagged as confirmed somatic mutations. These are considered the high quality pairs of associations in the database. And last, for these slides, I will show results uh, from samples for whole exome studies. So we have more than 9,000 patients, of which roughly half are from the TCGA. So by going to COSMIC, we can get the TCGA data. And we have roughly the same uh, sample size from additional more or less 100 studies, some of which could be very small. Uh, so as in the expression case, you want to know for which disease ontology terms can we learn something that is robust. Here we have <coughs> 52 terms with at least 50 patients from at least three uh, different uh, studies. And you can run a bunch of multi-label algorithms, perform leaf data set out cross-validation, and look at the results that you get. Uh, we observed that tree-based or random forest-based algorithms work uh, better. We also observed that most terms are tiny, okay, 100 samples or, two, uh, or 200 samples, and you need many trees to gain robustness, and it takes a lot of time to do that for each disease. Uh, so basically what we do is we slightly change the random forest algorithm. Uh, without going into details too much, we basically just downsample the background set of a disease at the time, and now we can easily learn 1,000 or 2,000 uh, trees for each uh, disease. As a secondary effect, what you get is, is when the classifier is learned, now the negative sets have more weight when we learn the algorithm, uh, the classifier. Uh, these are some results that we get. We can see here comparison of the different algorithms. Uh, just for simplicity, by the number of uh, disease ontology terms with at least rock score of 0.7, for each algorithm, we, cut, we just count the number of terms that separates well the positives from the negatives, the positive from the background controls, and the terms that actually perform well in both. Here we can see the variant of the random forest. It performs much better than all other algorithms. And here we can see some specification of the actual uh, terms that are in this uh, both uh, measure. You, and the, uh, we cover very different branches of the disease ontology uh, structure. It could be benign, kidney cancer, and so on. And just to give you some ideas of what is happening here, if you consider colorectal cancer, it is really well separated from the background. However, in the substructure of intestinal, intestinal cancers, it is not well separated from other uh, intestinal cancers. So it will have very high uh, separation from the background. So it will be counted here, but it is not counted in the both section. As another comment, you gain nothing j just by counting the number of mutations in a sample, okay, which could be counterintuitive uh, if you read 
some of the recent papers. And the main reason here is, is that there are very large differences between the TCGA studies and the other cosmic studies. Just to show you some uh, example, here we just count the number of mutations per sample in specific dough terms. Uh, this is a log two scale of the number of mutations. You can see that we can have a difference of by an order of magnitude by the median number of mutations in the sample. This is, here we have more mutations in the TCJ. On this dough term, it's completely reversed. In fact, for 42 disease ontology terms that we tested, in 22, we had a significant difference between these two distributions. Now, here it's significant in 0, 0, 1, Bonferroni corrected, so it's quite significant. Uh, it's slightly, in most cases, the TCGA had more uh, mutation, but it's not great. It's 9 versus 13. This is another very simple test that we did just to count the number of mutations per gene. And so here we see a very nice correlation between the TCGA and non-TCGA subparts of COSMIC. Okay. Another test that you can do, you can say, okay, let's learn classifiers on the TCGA samples and predict them or measure their performance on the non-TCGA samples, and we can do the reverse test. So here are the results that you can get. Uh, each point is, is, is a dough term. Uh, you have the rock score for the first test and the rock score for the second test. And interestingly, there is no difference in performance. The two subparts of the database perform more or less the same. For most terms in this uh, test, you get relatively high rock scores. But we need to take this whole plot with some caution because there are no negatives in this analysis. Okay. Uh, so in the last part of the talk, I will briefly explain a, a very simple way to just interpret the classifier. There is no uh, real algorithmic contribution here, but this simple analysis actually can help you refine some of the recent results that map genes to specific subtypes of cancer. So what do we do for a well-classified disease? We just take the genes random uh, forest importance scores. You can just take the top K. Here we just chose 50, for the example. We also calculate the enrichment scores of the genes. We basically just want to know if the gene is more mutated in the tested uh, 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 subtypes or, or, or less mutated. And then we just plot it on networks. And we already know that viewing these things in the context of network uh, is important, but we are not doing anything fancy here. So these are some results that we get for intestinal cancers. To plot the networks, we use GeneMania, so it adds some genes to improve connectivity. In this network, the node size is proportional to the random forest importance score, and the colors tell us whether or not this gene is more mutated in intestinal cancer or less mutated. Uh, so if you had a red, very red uh, color, then it means that this gene is very mutated in intestinal cancers. Here we see the summary of the results for colorectal cancer in the tumor portal, which is based on the paper by Lawrence in 2014. And here the genes are partitioned to three types, highly significantly mutated genes, genes that are significantly mutated, and genes that are just near significant. So what we can see here, we basically cover most of the highly significantly mutated genes. Uh, for the other types of uh, gene groups, there is a very low coverage in our analysis. Uh, on the other hand, we have some very interesting new candidates for uh, intestinal cancer genes that have very high importance scores, and they are very much mutated in the disease. Uh, these are results for kidney cancer. Here again, we see that we uh, cover the highly significantly mutated genes, uh, low coverage in the other groups. But for some genes, like, like TP53, the sign is reversed. In fact, when you analyze the complete cosmic database, it is less mutated in kidney cancer as compared to other cancer types. Okay. Uh, also, we have a cluster of genes that are, tend to be less mutated in kidney cancer. And so you can think that maybe a possible biological explanation is that we have a cluster of genes that have negative genetic interactions with the main pathway of kidney cancer. Uh, just as the last example, we uh, plot here the results for benign oplasm. So it's a non-TCGA example. And what do we see here? Just by performing the simple analysis, we can capture most of the or many genes that are uh, cancer genes by the PANCAN uh, analysis. Uh, most of them are less mutated in benign as compared to uh, real cancers. But some of them are surprisingly uh, more uh, uh, mutated in the benign oplasm, like VHL, PBRM1, 
in mTOR. Okay. So to summarize my part, uh, for our goals, TCGA was not enough. We go, went to Cosmic uh, and got uh, the added value. We can learn better and faster classifiers just by treating the negatives and the background controls differently. We can classify 20% of the terms that we tested. Some of them are not covered by the TCGA. Uh, when we think about classifier interpretation, we recapitulate the main cancer genes of each type, and we can offer, uh, we can refine the tumor protocol results by removing uh, very uh, low score genes, or adding new candidates, or even new terms to the pool. I didn't show that, but we have some analysis of the small scale data of the cosmic database. Here we have many more samples, but they come from a very well pre-selected set of genes, and only a third of the disease ontology terms become well classified. So it's better than the large scale experiments, but on the other hand, I would argue that it's probably much less than the, what the experts that compose the database uh, would think of. So that was my last slide. So we can take questions. Thank you. Right here. Time for some questions from both halves. Yeah. I was wondering, so comparing the two parts, when the first part the SVA transfer was test for expression, and in the second part the random forest mm -hmm. is it better for mutation? Yes. So I was wondering whether it is significant and what is, whether it does reveal something about the data or uh, the significant difference? Yes. Yeah, it's it's very sig the difference is very significant between the algorithms and uh, it could be that random forest is much more robust here in exploiting genes with very few mutations. It performs better in uh, binary data, but uh, we didn't look into this difference too much yet. One other comment about uh, this comparison. Uh, we were a bit uh, puzzled by the fact that uh, multi-label classifiers didn't do better, but uh, maybe it's just a problem with the, with the data that we have, you know, the, the, the disease ontology uh, tree is relatively large and uh, we don't have rich enough representation of sufficiently many nodes in order to be able to, to exploit the multi-label. We, we didn't use it at this point. But uh, there is some correlation with the number of mutations in a sample. And when we used that, we didn't see any added value. So the group of genes that are differentially expressed and the group of genes that are mutated, do they overlap a lot or are they more destroyed? There is some overlap. This is a part that Ron didn't show. Uh, our next goal would be to maybe explore this in more detail. Uh, this was our original goal, but over time we saw that each time you, you, when you analyze each part of the databases, the expression and the mutation, it gets more involved. So this would be our next goal, but there is some overlap that uh, is interesting. Any other questions? I had a question about the mutation, number of mutations in TCGA versus non-TCGA. Mm -hmm. So this was in cosmic data that you were looking? Yeah. Is it just sort of explained by the fact that it was a different experimental technique that was used? All exome versus uh, sequencing, or is it corrected? Some of them are not only all exome. And they, um, they curate it for, it could be, but in many cases it's reversed. So you have all exome as, that has a, an order of magnitude more mutations than TTCG. So it could explain some of the differences. Uh, and we, if you want to look in this in detail, we, you have to go back to the raw data in Cosmic and fish out the all exome versus all genome studies that they used. Right, that's right. Correct. And it covers yeah. Mm -hmm. and this was just done. Th these corrections weren't done. It was just straight from the yeah. mutations report. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? One more. Yeah. I was wondering about the cosmic data is also patient specific, like TCGA, and you have to aggregate it. Was there um, any specific way or conclusions that you got from aggregating from different patients? So, our pre processing is very simple. We just take what they consider as high quality mutations. So, we just take the pair. And we don't really exploit well the type of mutations, we just use a binary metric. So, it could be that if you perform or think of better algorithms that exploit this information, you can get more terms. 
but for now our processing is very simple. Okay, good. Let's thank the speakers again.